Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the place-based philanthropy session. It's thrilled to see all of you. Um, we were all commenting up here in the front of the stage that we think this is going to be the best panel. <laughs> and the reason, aside from the fact that it's us, is that um, we live what we do. This isn't work, this is a passion. And so we're really looking forward to having a conversation with you about what place-based philanthropy means and what are the values and the underpinnings and the strategy behind it. Uh, I'm Diana Bucco. I'm the president of the Buell Foundation from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And what I'd like to do is just introduce to you this tremendous panel that I have the privilege of sitting with. So to my far left, your right, is Lejeune Montgomery Tabron. She's the president and CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Next to her is Wes Moore. He's the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation from New York. To my right, your left, that's, this will be the hardest part of my day, you realize that, <laughs> is Shirley Franklin. She's the former mayor of Atlanta and the executive board chair of Purpose Built Communities. And next to her is Cindy Citrone, the founder and CEO of Citrone 33 Foundation. So, yay, yes, yes. Right? That's a good start. Definitely a good start. Well, we already like this audience. Mm -hmm. um, so we just want to go ahead and get started by throwing out one broad question for the entire panel, which is talk a little bit about the change or problem you were trying to address, and why did you choose to do that through place-based philanthropy? And Cindy, if I can ask you to go first, sure. and, and Cindy's a little bit different because she is a personal philanthropist. She has chosen to do this. Well, um, well, and I think you too, Shirley, but the rest of us represent institutions, and it's a different type of commitment. So if you wouldn't mind just jumping in. Yeah, Andy, if you'll sort of give me a little leeway here um, as, first of all, what an amazing conference this has been, and I thanked to Milken and the Center for Strategic Philanthropy for inviting me here to share with you um, some of our views. And, and if you may have noticed, you know, Mike's doing the big project with the American Dream. So I'm going to kind of take you back a little step to really how we got into this. And what has happened is um, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. And I met my husband in Richmond, Virginia at a bar. And the first night we met, he said, you should go out with me. And I said, why would I go out with you? And he said to me, the American Dream, he said, I own a boat. He said, I speak French. And one day, I'm going to own a share of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm. I said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that is the most, that is like telling me you are a Kennedy. Because everyone knows the Roonies own the Pittsburgh Steelers. Family business, and that'll never happen. Can I tell you, 30 years later, he owned a very small boat. Maybe nothing more than a kayak or a canoe for some fishing. <laughs> Speaks a few words of French that I think he learned from a Beatles song. <laughs> but we own, co-own, 10% of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm -hmm. So if there was a promise you were going to deliver on, that was the promise to pick. <laughs> so back to like, all right, Cindy, great story, but how does that get to play-spaced? Which, by the way, I always thought was play-spaced, and I kind of liked that too, because like, you know, I'm having a play date, my play space. So Rob's father was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. This was about four or five years ago, and at the time, our foundation in philanthropy was doing grant making. We were all over the map. You know, someone came to us with a good cause. We were grateful patients. Friend had a gala. We weren't really directed or movement in one way, and we had just met this group called the Center for Strategic Philanthropy. We loved the vision of what Mike was doing, and we said, let's work with them. So the first project we bought them, brought to them, we said, Rob's father has been diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. This is a personal project for us. We want to make a major movement in this field. What can we do? In center strategic way, they convened. In Milken way, they convened. Two days of the best experts in the world, researchers, scientists, someone from the government, someone who led the patient advocacy group. And at the end of two days, that table came to us, and Milken came to us, and they said, you're not using all your treasures, OK? You have your talent, your treasure, your time. You're not using your ties. If you go back to the Pittsburgh Steelers and ask them to do an organ donation day at one game, we have the potential to register 60,000 people, mm -hmm. OK? 95% of people support organ donation. 
in the city of Pittsburgh at the time, it's tough to tell because we rely on DMV for, you know, 40 to 42 percent were registered. So if we went to Pittsburgh and did one game and just, you know, one day, and I'm like, this is beautiful. These are the most brilliant people. I get to go home. Pittsburgh is home, as you can tell. Met my husband. My youngest son's name is Steel R. We live, <laughs> eat, and breathe Pittsburgh. Why the idea of doing my philanthropy work in Pittsburgh never occurred to me before? I don't know. So we said, let's do it. So as we started to call the Steelers and we said, would we do it? The way we had invested in Pittsburgh before, because it was important to us, was through the Pittsburgh Penguins. They had a grant-making foundation, and we would match any grant they made. Because I felt like I didn't have boots on the ground, but they were doing due diligence. So when they found out we were doing this organ donation campaign, they said, what about us? Like, we have been your partners. You can't leave us out. We want in. Well, then the pirates wanted in. And then when the universities found out about it, it was a total grassroots uprising, okay? So we had all six universities involved in it. We had over 35 other businesses, organizations, nonprofits sign up to be a part of this, this we called it the City of Champions. And I wear this because this is my greatest accomplishment to get all three teams' logos on a t-shirt <laughs> was a challenge. Mm. <laughs> so well. this is what we decided to do, and this is why place-based with us is because it made sense. We wanted to leverage those ties that we weren't utilizing, and we wanted to find a solution for, our kit, for organ donation. So stay tuned. Thank you. So you're hearing a couple things there, right? She chose to be very strategic, um, to partner, to build collaboratives and to leverage her resources. I want to take it all the way to the other end, very focused and very deep. Um, Lejeune, you're running a national foundation, and yet you are taking on a piece of it for place-based. How does that happen? What does that look like? Absolutely. Uh, and just for everyone, uh, our focus is children. <laughs> we'll keep Kellogg created, the Kellogg Foundation, to improve the lives of the most vulnerable children in the world. Uh, and he, he told us how he envisioned that happening. He actually said that uh, people in community have uh, the best understanding of what change looks like for their children and their families. So at the Kellogg Foundation, even though we're focused on children, we know that children live in families and families are in communities. And when you look at communities, uh, some communities just are not thriving and children are not thriving in those communities. And we're about to celebrate our 90th anniversary. Uh, but on the journey of improving the lives of children, what we've learned is um, you do have to work with people. People have the capacity to improve their own lives and their communities. And so one of the things that we focused on is how do you lift up leadership? How do you build leadership around young people and families? Uh, and then we've learned that there are two other pieces, and we call this our DNA. We focus on leadership. We focus on community engagement, because we understand that uh, communities are fully diverse uh, places. And everyone from all places in the community, those seen and unseen, have to be a part of the solution. And so we make sure that in our lens, we're, we're seeing everyone, and everyone is being seen. And then the third part of our DNA, we talk about structures that prevent children from thriving. And what we've learned is racism and the structural racial structures and communities unfortunately leave too many children behind. And so we're very vocal about that and we help leaders and communities understand the structural barriers within their communities and how those barriers can be transformed. And who transform them? People do. So we work with people. Uh, our work is in partnership. We work alongside uh, people who want to come together. Uh, Mr. Kellogg actually left us a formula. He said it is only through cooperative planning and intelligent study that leads to group action on behalf of the whole of a community. So he said bring people together, people from every aspect of the community, from the resident to the doctor to the teacher to the phys physician, and bring knowledge, not just research, not just research that comes down, 
but allow people in community to bring their knowledge, their expertise, their understanding. And between the cooperative planning and the intelligence study, you all can come to a common shared vision of what group action looks like on behalf of every child in the community. And that's the actual approach that we uh, take in all of our work. And even though we're national and international, what we've learned is it still works. You take all the knowledge from all of those places and all the partners that we have, and it can be localized. And you have to then be very focused on what people in the community want, how the adaptation works for them, and let them lead their own change. And we're starting to see results doing it that way. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And Wes, you're doing it at a, in New York. Yes. We are. Tell us how you're doing that. Um, and how that, and, what so, and the issue that you really felt you had to go after on this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's, uh, when Robin Hood first began about 31 years ago, um, it really began under this, uh, a basic premise of in a city of New York and in a country like the United States that has so much, why for so many people do they have so little? Um, and how can we really be thoughtful about ways of addressing it? Um, how can we be creative? How can we make sure we're incorporating community voice into this work? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think about it for, the, for when we talk about this issue of, of, of poverty, um, we talk about the fact that 42% that of, of all New Yorkers over the past three years have experienced poverty, almost half of the entire city. We talk about the fact that 40% of all people in this country could not afford a $400 unexpected bill or a $400 shock. We talk about the fact that the fastest growing population of people who are living in poverty right now are actually the working poor. Mm -hmm. So it's people who have jobs, in some cases multiple jobs, and still are living below the poverty level. And when people sometimes say, they're like, well, is it education? Or is it transportation? Or is it housing? Or is it criminal justice? Or is it health? Uh, the honest answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Poverty is all-encompassing, and it's violent, and it's unnecessary. And when we think about it from that frame, I think that's exactly how Robin Hood really looked to create these platforms out of poverty, because they understand when you're talking about individuals and communities that oftentimes the poverty is, is, is generational, poverty is predictable, that when you have a systemic breakdown, the only way to address it is a systemic buildup. The only way to address it is to take every single system and structure that touches that child and make sure that it's reinforced. To take every single system and structure that's intended to be able to support that family and make sure that they're bolstered. And using every single means in order to be able to do that. And, uh, and, and, and I love what you're talking about, Lejeune, about this idea of, of, of community is you know, we believe deeply in this idea that, that the people who are closest to the challenge are also gonna be closest to the solutions. Our job is not to help to save people. Our job is to help to move barriers that have been constructed in front of people. And our job is to make sure we're working with community to be able to identify the large solutions. You know, we have, we have a, a, a part of our, our, part of Robin Hood is a group called the Design Insight Group. Really with the Design Insight Group, it's a very fancy way of saying it's 1,100 New Yorkers who are currently living in poverty and we pay them and we make them part of our team because they help to craft every single solution we will fund and invest in. Mm. It's the same thing like, you know, a, a phone company would not create a phone company without having a user test group. Mm -hmm. So we want to create and try to help and build solutions by working with community to be able to identify what would work, where are the biggest challenges, what are the things that need to be invested in, where are the breakdowns, that we can then help to build up the structural elements that can be able to help agree, create a greater level of solution. And so when we're talking about poverty in New York City, poverty as a larger element, you know, part of the reason that we became so place-based and focused on place so deliberately from the very beginning um, is A, it's the way you're going to drive the answers that you're looking for. And, and B, you know, and I take it as a person who is now the CEO of an organization, that one of the first communities that the organization invested in was the community I grew up in, that this is a group of people who take this work very, very personally. And that's why I think we decided to have that level of focus on them. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shirley, you ha uh, have been at the forefront of purpose-built communities for, even though you took a little break to go do a little thing called running 
the city of Atlanta. You have really <laughs> been driving that. Tell us, what, 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 drove, what was that all about? I wish I could take all that credit. So let me just say ditto, ditto, ditto Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to start. I mean, because there's a lot of experience and knowledge, including you, on this stage, on this topic. So in Atlanta's case, mm -hmm. um, we had a high percentage of people living in public housing on a per capita basis. And that had been a topic of a lot of discussion uh, between civic and business leaders and government leaders for a decade or so. And our founder formed a, a relationship with a tenant um, community um, in public housing. Uh, and through a relationship between the housing authority, the resident leadership, and a philanthropist, they fashioned a model. And it was a place-based model related to one community um, with one of the strongest women. She really should have been the first woman mayor, but she didn't have the opportunities that um, some of, the, of, of us have had. And they decided that they wanted to attack the key issues in that community, and they fashioned a model uh, that is a combination of schools, a combination of housing, uh, a combination of community wellness and community engagement, uh, and a neighborhood focus. And we or they organized that through a not-for-profit called the Eastlake Foundation. They were beginning to have some success, new housing, new school, better in performance with school children, um, lower crime rate, more people interested in investing in the neighborhood. And other people heard about this and started visiting. As a matter of fact, you told me one of your visits was. One of my first was to Atlanta for a purpose-built communities mm -hmm. conference mm -hmm. when I was a little baby. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the result of that was uh, the three who started it thought everyone would go off and do it. And then they started checking back year after year and said, well, they started, well, maybe they did a school. Maybe they did an early uh, childhood center. Maybe they did some housing. But somehow or another, there were some obstacles to doing kind of what we'd call a holistic or, or comprehensive approach. So a few philanthropists got together and uh, with Mr. Cousins leading that effort and said, well, what if we fund an organization that helps people to do this? Purpose Built Communities was founded 10 years ago to do exactly that. That's 10 years after doing it ourselves on the ground. Uh, and what we found is that there's a lot of interest, far more interest than we can uh, respond to. But on the other hand, there's also a lot of angst and fear uh, because there are obstacles along the way. And I, I am sure in all of these stories, people could tell you some of the obstacles. Mm -hmm. The easiest thing would be getting the three teams on the t-shirt <laughs> compared to some of the work that has to go on on the ground. So now we are in over 20 cities, yeah. and we go where we're invited, and we are, we call ourselves consultants, but we're really partners. We help to bring the experience of doing this in Atlanta for 20 years uh, to other communities who are interested. And we're thrilled um, that 40 or 50 cities on any given day are calling us and are working with us to do this kind of work. So what were we trying to solve? We were trying to solve the problem of intergenerational poverty that has been institutionalized by policy and tradition in this country. As I only know the urban areas, someone else can speak to the rural areas, but in the urban areas, it has been traditional that certain communities are poor and certain communities are disinvested and certain communities are forgotten. And we are trying to break that cycle. So that was your question. Well said, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, so one of the things that's different about place-based is it's proactive, not reactive. We're not waiting for people to come to us. It's anchored in assets. And what you're hearing is assets are defined first as people, second as places, and the last are resources. Because candidly, billions have been dumped into these issues, and we haven't solved them. So that's not where the assets are coming from. 
but ultimately it will lead to the redistribution of resources that will result in systemic change. That's what this is all about. And it's not easy, to your point. So I'd love to hear, what are some of the challenges, right? We're talking about our passion, but this is, um, so I am the product of two, my parents were immigrants, and I often say, my father worked in the fields 12 hours a day, and my mom would say, Diane, the water you carry is just as heavy as your dad's. So talk mm -hmm. about the challenges, mm -hmm. right? What are they? Who would like to jump? Sure, I'll just start. Um, I think for a philanthropy, the first challenge is building trust in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and this was something that we uh, considered very deeply. And structurally, we knew that we needed to change in order to meet the community where they were. So we, first of all, we have uh, communities named places throughout the United States as well as in Haiti and in Mexico, uh, both the Yucatan and Chiapas regions. But in the United States is Mississippi, New Orleans, Michigan, and New Mexico. And in those places, in order to build trust, we put an office in each of those locations. We hired local people from each of those locations. They run those operations. And we committed to the community publicly that we would be there for at least a generation. Uh, because, and we didn't define what a generation is. It's what I say is when all the children are thriving, because that's why we're there in the first place. Uh, but we needed to do that because Communities are used to uh, philanthropies popping in and popping out. Uh, and, and they feel as if all the power enters and leaves. And, and what we needed to do was make sure that we planted that power and the direction in the community. And so we wanted our people to have to go to the grocery store and meet a grantee and be accountable to what was happening in those places. So uh, that was the first thing. thing. Building trust, I think, is, is the most important thing and letting them know that they're, what they say matters and, and that we're there to serve them and their children. We're not bringing all the answers, but we do have resources. And so I think the other thing that we've been able to do is you have to build relationships. And those are not just relationship between the philanthropist and the grantee, but it's all the members of the communities. How do you build relationships with the governor, with the mayor, with the legislators, with the residents, uh, with the other nonprofit organizations? And I think the one thing that we had to do was we, weren't, we had to show and prove to them that we weren't going to do these power plays, that we were going to pull everyone into the conversations, and we were, we were going to be patient. And we could be patient. We weren't on terms. We were committed for a generation. This is a long-term game. It's not a, a sprint. And we had to prove that we would be there for the long term. So I, I know I asked a question, a broad question, but let's just continue that theme for a second, this idea of long term, right? So another piece to this is we're not going to have the idea of the day, right? We're going we're gonna to stick it out. So can, you, can, can I ask you? Yeah, uh, actually, we were Cindy. the opposite. We wanted to be the idea of the day. Mm. We wanted to come in with a sense of urgency. We said to our partners, and I really want to rebound on what you said, that trust. So what our greatest difficulty was is, is I was relaying on my relationships. I was going to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I've never done anything like this before in my life. So I had a, you know, I know there were models, but we were, we were kind of trying to decide how is this going to be done. And I wanted to make sure that I protected that relationship. They were a super brand. I better bring them super brand materials and super brand. So, and we actually made the promise to them. Now, it's not as the way it ended up, but we said, this is the only time I'm going to make this ask. <laughs> we had an urgency because Famous when last we, words. <laughs> right, right. We, well, it's kind of turned out nice. What happened is what is when Obama was leaving his administration, he had named organ donation one of his core social impact issues. So if we got a press release out literally before December 18th, we then had like white, and I didn't know any, but we had White House dissemination, automatic endorsement to the entire world. So we put a deadline on ourselves that this organ donation day had to occur before December of 2018. So all of a sudden, we don't have a logo, we don't have a name, we just have an idea and we had a year to do it. So 
like I said, that, but, but we wanted to value that trust. We were going to rely on those relationships. So we did. We went to them and said, this is a one-time thing. We're going to put all eyes on it. We are going to do whatever we can with a sense of urgency. At the end, we turned every asset that we had in organ donation over to established agencies, core recovery. We did do some legislative work, and we even told them. You know, we were able to get some um, a law changed. We were able to raise $4 million that we put into legacy projects. And, but we said, we're going to be done. Like, we're done. This was a one-time ask. The city came back to us. The partners came back to us and said, we want to do this again. We love this. It was easy. It felt good. This is what fans do. We get together. We champion a cause. And we raise a trophy. And they wanted to do it on mental well-being. Okay? And I'm like, oh, my. Checking a box to be an organ donor is an easy message to deliver. <laughs> well-being you know so that's what we're currently in the process of now of developing this campaign but but i'm going to push a little bit because the can theme, i push but, back first absolutely go so, ahead so so okay. i mean that yeah. but that would you would be a good group but you said yes. we could absolutely yeah. so absolutely. i mean I, i'm pushing not back but no, pushing with her because i mean my experience as mayor once you have a big success yeah. Yeah. then the whole idea is to build on that and to leverage it. Right. Mm. And that's what you're doing. Can you help me get this in Atlanta? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and surely, that's, that's exactly where I was going. One time. <laughs> no, and, and I, the, re the, reason I, the reason I say that is, especially when you do something hard. Right. You know, I used to say, when I was in office and even now, I mean, pretty much anybody can do the easy things where someone's already doing them. Mm. The question is, are we committed to do the hard things? Uh, the uncomfortable things, the things that stretch us a little bit. And that's what you've shown. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually think that's a model for leadership, mm -hmm. uh, a really important model, especially around these issues. The issues of poverty and racism and, and discrimination and isolation and lack of job, those aren't new to America. We're now saying, all of us in here, and fortunately some other folks are saying, yeah, that's not new, but we're going to do something about it this time. Yeah. And we're going to take the lessons from the past and make it happen. So I say cheers. Go for yeah. it. And, and, and actually, I just <laughs> wanted to, and, and to just further reinforce it, I'm, for, I'm pushing in a good way, yeah. is she built trust, right? All the stuff Lejeune was just talking about, built trust. The com listened. The community, she heard at a national level, donors were right. was important. But then the community came back and said mental health is important. So those same themes is what's making Cindy a really effective place-based philanthropist. Wes, how, talk to us. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would also say, I think one of the biggest challenges that, the, that we have in the world of philanthropy is also humility. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, we have to understand that, that we're not going to philanthropy our way out of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, there are structural challenges. There's histories. You know, we can't talk about what's happened and the issues that we face in so many communities, you know, without talking about the history of things like redlining and discriminatory housing policies, discriminatory loan policies, the fact that even still to this day, women do not make, uh, you know, still make less than a dollar for every male dollar that's earned. So, I mean, like, there are structures that we have to be honest about. Um, and, and I think with that, the role that philanthropy plays in this is that how can we make sure our philanthropic dollars are catalytic? How can we make sure that these issues that we are funding, these issues that we are behind, that it's not just about how to fund something, right? I mean, we always say our, our, our capital should be patient, but it should not be permanent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The goal of it is not to make sure that there's a steady line item. The goal of this is to make sure that we're actually ending something that we all are focused on ending. You know, I, I think about, you know, you, you, you take, take the issue of, of criminal justice as just one example, right? Um, you know, we fund some of the best criminal justice reform programs out there. We fund some of the best job training programs out there. We use data and metrics and analytics to be able to back up every single investment that we make. But here's the reality. When someone comes home, which by the way represents 95% of people who are currently incarcerated, Right? Only 5% are there for either life or long-term sentences. And that doesn't include the ones who will then come home and then be on state supervision, parole, and probation. So when you come home, 
we say welcome home, but by the way, in many places, by the way, you can't live in public housing, even if your family's there. Mm -hmm. So your family now has to make a choice. And you can apply for jobs, but remember, many federal and state jobs are not open to you. And even if you do apply for many jobs, or particularly private jobs, there's boxes you have to check. Knowing the fact that 75% of people who have to check boxes will not complete the application because psychologically they've already been eliminated. And you can apply for school, but remember, you've got to check boxes for that too. And even if, you, even, if you, even if you get accepted, you can apply for Pell Grants or state aid, but welcome home. Philanthropy is not going to fix that, mm -hmm. right? Those are policies. Those are structures. And so our ability to be humble in our work, our ability to understand what becomes our lane, what becomes our role, what becomes the unique ways we can use our capital to be catalytic, mm -hmm. to be able to address structure, that, that is, I think, a kind of unique place when we talk about the challenges of philanthropy and ways that philanthropy, philanthropy can help fill those challenges. That's a unique place that philanthropy can help fill. And I have, uh, I agree with Wes 100%. I was just wanting to share some examples uh, to just really show how that humility looks in real life. Uh, uh, I was so happy earlier today that I, I sat down for lunch and I was sitting with uh, the governor of Mississippi. So Mississippi is one of our name places. And uh, Mississippi is tough. I don't know uh, huh. if uh, any of you have spent time. My actual family is from Clarksdale, Mississippi, and there were 10 children of us. And we ended up growing up in, in uh, Detroit in, in Michigan. But in Mississippi, the school district has been disinvested in for decades, okay? And in Mississippi, what happens is when you're a, an F, a failing school, you are taken over by the state, you're given a conservator, and you are probably in perpetual underachievement forever. It has been proven over and over again that uh, takeovers do not work. Uh, and here we were in Mississippi looking at the Jackson Public School District, and it was about to be taken over. And it's kind of like a rote process in Mississippi. So many of the schools are in conservatorship. Uh, it's hard to find a, one that's not. Uh, but here we were with another moment where a school was about to be taken over and we had an opportunity to forge some new partnerships and relationships and it was really uh, the desire of the residents. They did not want to be taken over. They wanted a new way. Uh, and so we were able to play that bipartisan, neutral uh, structure in the conversation which led to a memorandum of understanding between the Republican governor of Mississippi, the Democratic mayor of Jackson, uh, uh, the city of Jackson, the school district of Jackson, and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation collectively coming together and saying, uh, we're going to put um, a transformative plan in place that doesn't include takeover, but instead includes community-driven governance, and uh, a process by which this school will achieve once again. And it took that kind of, of relationship building at a totally different, in a space that was, you know, unprecedented. Uh, and yet this, this uh, new structure has now been formed and concreted. And there's a new school district in place. They are making some very, uh, significant progress toward student achievement, and it's showing a new model for a state that uh, knew no other way in getting their children into a different place. So that's an example, example of, you know, it's not about the money, that's right. but it's about how do you build relationships and trust where by, in a pi bipartisan space, everyone comes because they're, they care about the kids. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you were willing to do something new, though. Exactly, mm -hmm. because one of the one of the big challenges is change, right? And you know, just the difference in how we drive home, or ride the subway, or however we get there. When there is a disruption in that, we're a little bit annoyed. Mm -hmm. So when we are going in to communities and suggesting that there is a new way to do it without the trust, um, you, you you you'll just be there forever. So we think in Purpose Built that there are about 800 neighborhoods where there's high poverty level 
uh, in the United States. It's concentrated poverty where you can demonstrate pretty much everything we're saying. And uh, those 800 neighborhoods um, get a series of different interventions. Uh, and the question is, are there models? We think we have one, but we don't think we're the only one where you can actually provide those interventions so that in a generation, whether it's in Jackson or Pittsburgh or Atlanta or Omaha or Houston or LA, <laughs> um, in a generation you can see this change. And I really think that's the policy issue mm -hmm. that we're all trying to address. Um, I mean, each of us could tell you why what we do is the right way, and perhaps it is, but it may not be the only way. Mm -hmm. And um, so partnership, leadership, trust, humility is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, staying power, perseverance, um, a willingness to be wrong, that's a good mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. uh, and to start all over again. And having philanthropy there with you gives you kind of the cushion that you need to take the risk to make the change. So that it is not just a government official looking at you, exactly. but rather someone who's on the same page with you and trying to make the change. So I'm not a philanthropist in the traditional sense. We are a not-for-profit supported by philanthropists. But that's one of the key roles that philanthropy plays in the work that we do, which is the staying power to say, we know this isn't easy, we know it's going to take some time, we know that there are going to be some ruffled feathers, but perhaps with, your, with the resources of philanthropy, not just money, mm -hmm. but um, credibility and relationships, uh, we can move through a new model. So, so there are a couple other things about that. One, we, I mean, you and I talked about this at lunch today, right? We're, we're the neutral convener. Mm -hmm. So that trust is also, a lot of times, we don't have, we don't have an agenda. We don't have skin in the game. So it, it, in, a, in, a, in a very volatile world we're living in today, to have someone who can come in with that is very important. Mm -hmm. And um, the other piece of that is, um, oh, I forgot what it was going to be. Um, the, the other piece of it is then, the v, I remember, the, the VC, we're sort of venture capitalists, right? Mm -hmm. It's about risk. It's about our, our willingness to take the risk to make the bet and to, to recognize that it's not about being right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's about getting closer to truth. So, um, Wes, talk a little bit about how you've done that, because at the heart of this is innovation. We want to innovate. We want to get it right. We want to scale it up, and we want to replicate. That's right. How does that happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we thrive on being risk capital, mm -hmm. right? We thrive on this idea that you can use data and analytics to be able to identify what are going to be the smart investments you can make with an exclusive focus of either scale or takeover, right? Uh, or, you know, as we call it, you know, we like taking our things public, mm -hmm. right? which basically means how are you making sure that you're, the innovation that you can be behind and fund and put the thought research into that eventually can touch. You know, one of the first, you know, uh, uh, first things that Robinhood uh, was, was investing in early on a, on a system-wide basis was us on this idea of needle exchanges. Mm -hmm. And Robinhood started funding needle exchanges when nobody would touch it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was too risky. What do you mean we're giving needles to drug users, all this kind of stuff. And Robinhood said, well, the data shows us that this actually could significantly impact the spread of HIV AIDS. And so Robinhood funded it. Now, Robinhood doesn't fund needle exchanges. Nobody does. The reason is because the federal government does it, mm -hmm. right? But they were never going to be first money in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not built that way, mm -hmm. right? But we are. Philanthropy can be built that way. So whether you're talking about, you know, uh, we put in $4 million about four years ago uh, into this idea of being able to provide legal assistance for people living in public housing so they can stay public, stay in public housing. Now, last year, the city of New York just put in $150 million into it because they saw that it worked. Or whether it's uh, an investment that we made four years ago in something called Action Health NYC, which basically said that we think everyone should be guaranteed the right to health, in to, to, to health insurance, regardless of your documentation status. And just about five months ago, the mayor of New York City just announced something called NYC Cares, which is basically taking Action Health NYC and now making sure that it is citywide, that everybody has health insurance regardless of documentation status. The idea of saying we can invest in things early, prove that it works, de-risk it, and then present it to partners who can then say, now it's our job to take it over. Mm -hmm. But we have no problem being the secondary, we have no problem being the Series B or the Series C investor, because we can be the Series A investor. Mm -hmm. We can go ahead and take the risk. We can fail, and we'll make sure we fail better next time. That's right. But we can use data and we can use research to make sure that ideas that need oxygen can get the oxygen that they need to work. 
And then once you can take those concepts and take those ideas and build them out, and say real quick, it's the very first thing that brought me to Robin Hood was we started doing work on this issue of veterans homelessness. You know, I came back from Afghanistan and I noticed that everything that I wanted or needed or my paratroopers wanted or needed while we were deployed, we got. And then I would come home and I had paratroopers who were waiting eight, nine months to see a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so Robin Hood, uh, so I became, I, be, I became very active in the veterans advocacy space because I thought that there were some serious promises being broken. Mm -hmm. And so when this, we had this issue where we had hundreds of veterans in, in New York City alone who were sleeping on the streets and we had this serious issue of, of veterans homelessness in New York City. And Robin Hood said, okay, we think we can put some money and some ideas and some collaboration around this effort mm -hmm. of working on veterans homelessness. You know, now the number of veterans homelessness in New York City is essentially functionally zero. Mm -hmm. It's essentially functionally zero. Also because not only does New York City have a right to shelter, but for every single veteran who, who is currently living on the streets, and we know for a fact the number is probably around 30 right now, it's they all have access to resources and supports that were not there before. That's where philanthropy can be unique and philanthropy can be catalytic. Use data, use risk to be able to become those early investors yeah. to say, mm -hmm. you know, our job is not to start something. Our job is to end something. Mm -hmm. Cindy, talk, yeah, you're about to do that really bold around a big issue, mental health. A big issue, mental health. Yeah. And let me say, as a Robin Hood, but you, you are, a, let me put it in my terms, you're like the Tom Brady of philanthropy, mm -hmm. right? Yes. New York yeah. listens to you. And, and, and that's what we're saying. And that's sort of what we're trying to identify in Pittsburgh. We, the Steelers are, so the point that we thought too is, how do we capture that impact? How do we leverage that influence that we have to create this movement? And that's kind of what was really important to us is, you know, because our athletes get asked a lot, the teams get asked a lot. And we went to each of our partners, you know, in that way and said, and, and strategically and saying, What's the ask that we want? What are we going to ask in mental well-being? Okay, well, and, and, and we wanted to make sure that we created a whole a la carte menu of how you could get involved. Okay, and we did that with every partner from the coffee shop. All we're going to ask you to do is to put on your, you know, uh, your, your cozy cup uh, phrase. But, you know, we're going to go to PNC and saying we want you to fund major studies on depression. So we are looking at every single partner in this city. We want you to be hit over the head with this issue, but we want to say we want everyone to contribute and everyone to benefit. And that's why we are. We are well-being. We are not health because every one of us, mm. we are going to actually attempt. It's very ambitious. I'm moving away from that, but we're going to attempt to teach a city a mental well-being skill, a coping skill. Take a time out. We are going to put it in city language, you know? We're going to have it in Pittsburghese. We're going to say, hey, Yinzers. We're going to have Ben Roethlisberger do it before the two-minute warning on a jumbotron. <laughs> and we're looking just like Milken and CSP had us find a treasure like that we haven't said. We're looking to find where that white space, where that is. So, and how we can do that. And you could only do that in a place-based campaign or movement, right? And we're really blessed because Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is right for it. it I, I don't know if anyone's ever been there, but my favorite Pittsburgh story to tell why the culture, and we've identified this and how do we touch this is, someone just told me their day, said I went to Pittsburgh and, and I uh, and just moved there and I asked my neighbor, I said, can you tell me the number for a taxi to the airport? And my neighbor said, no, I'll take you. And he said, no, 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 I was like at 5 a.m. He's like, no, I'll take you. Like, you know, that's it. So how do we leverage that? How do we identify those sort of secret? And that's what's been really exciting and challenging for us. And that's why I'm so excited that we're going to get to go back and do it again. And we're not going to do it until we are ready and right. And we're going to invite everybody to the table. And we're going to make you feel good about being a part of that. And you're going to see it everywhere. And stay tuned again. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So this is about changing hearts, Oops. changing hearts and minds. It's about changing hearts and minds at the system level and at the people level. Right. And Shirley, you said earlier, change is hard and change is scary. A lot of the great stories you've just heard about is how we've gotten our systems to change. Shirley, can you talk a little bit? How do we get the readiness on the part of people? If I've grown up in an environment where every day everything around me tells me that those opportunities are, for, are out there but not for me, mm -hmm. right? If that's what my world reinforces every day, then what, how do we get people ready? So our, so our different initiatives are called network members. Mm -hmm. And they are not-for-profits, on-the-ground, local people 
who have invited us in, and then they form a not-for-profit to do the work of schools and wellness and housing, and basically building community, and branding it, and all of that. And I just watched a TED Talk by our network member leader in um, Tulsa, and he said, we need proximity. We have to be in each other's place. Lejeune said that too. We have got to find a way to get people to see each other and not see the shadows or the, or the stereotypes that we all grow up with. And proximity means you have to work in the space. So for instance, in our original initiative, mm -hmm. which is at Eastlake, the, the head of school for our, we have a charter school, K to, excuse me, six weeks to 12, um, started at 300, lowest performing school in the city district 20 years ago, now in the top five, still heavily uh, free and reduced lunch, all the statistics. He lives in the neighborhood. Because the neighborhood has been reclaimed in a way that people of various incomes can live. He lives in the neighborhood. The teachers live in the neighborhood. People walk to school. They're engaged in the neighborhood and they believe they own it. So um, Kurt said, and I, I'm, I'm a believer, proximity. Now sometimes you have to manufacture proximity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to create an environment and a, a, a cause and a campaign that makes people feel that right. they're a part yeah, of we it. We have a big neighborhood part of our campaign. Exactly, but the, but the point of the matter is we have to get to know each other and listen to each other. And you know, as a former elected official, it was really easy to not listen to anybody because most of the time people, <laughs> no, I'm telling you the truth, are complaining. By the time they got to the mayor, it was a complaint. <laughs> Didn't matter where they were from. It could be a bank president or it could be a man on the street, you know? The key element to me being able to function in that job and have my mental health yes. stability mm -hmm. was for me to rethink that every single day and say these are all just people and I need to listen to whoever it is, regardless of whether I want to hear it, whether I have the answer and they don't want the answer, they just want to talk about it. See, some of you have been to community meetings. <laughs> you are those people. Um, but whatever the circumstance is, but to put yourself in the place, and it, it also goes back to Wes's point, which is it takes a certain amount of humility and developing a skill Communications is more than what you have to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is listening and having the humility to, uh, to know that the other person has something that you need to hear. Uh, and that takes some work. Mm -hmm. So you have to build that structurally into your organization because it's very, it's, we called it executive amplitude. When any one of these fancy people speak, everyone else in the room is not gonna say much. <laughs> So they have to work at yeah. mm -hmm. being a part of the of the wallpaper. Nobody does yeah. wallpaper anymore, but wallpaper. One hundred percent. You know, in order to get everyone engaged in it, and there's a whole set of leadership skills around that, which I'm I'm going to stop talking, but because you get my point. Um, so bringing to, humility. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to just share some work that we're doing. Uh, it's called our Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation effort. Uh, and when we first launched, we put about $25 million into this effort, which was about building community and relationships. And it was all intended to change the hearts and minds of people in community. And some people came to us and said, why are you all putting your money in this soft space? This healing stuff, that's soft. That's, you know, that's not like the Kellogg Foundation. But actually, what we have come to know is that is the most difficult work that you can do. And you don't do racial equity work without first starting with racial healing and bringing people together and allowing the space and the safety of a space to, to get to know one another on a human level and to begin to think about, you know, how do I develop empathy for circumstances that are not my own? But then that's the knowledge that we can use to then transform this community so that it works for all of us. And we have 14 of these places all over the nation uh, and places that you all may know because of 
their own journeys, Dallas, Chicago, California, uh, Selma, Alabama, but they're doing this hard work and, and, and it's not easy work, uh, but they're committed to it and they get to define, you know, what transformation looks like for them, but they are uh, really soul searching doing a personal journey as well as a collective journey and getting to a new space around what what my truth is, what your truth is, what our truth is. And and that's what leads to the real transformative effort. And you know, I call that disruptive work in philanthropy. Yeah, you can yes, do risk taking right. and then you can be just totally disruptive. Yeah. And I think shifting it about what the core uh, change strategy looks like is something that we are really focusing in on and it's about you know start with the people it's human beings that we're dealing with yeah I often say to my my team we bring our a game no matter who we meet with exactly. at every given moment we give them everything we've got and people see that and when they see it they connect mm -hmm. and from there the world's a different place. Mm -hmm. well, so, I, I go think, ahead, please. I think that's why that became so important to us with this mental well-being is the connectivity, is we realize we are never gonna have the services to deliver one-to-one -one if we don't start peer-to-peer -peer counseling and educate that. I mean, there's the ultimate way to scale. Great, so um, we are running at the end of our time and it went fast. And I feel like we're just getting warmed up and kind of <laughs> sad, but uh, I wanna give our panelists the opportunity to give a closing thought and what I wanted to ask each of you to do is uh, to think about this within the context of systems change and if you could give a, gr a brief thought about what you would want to share with our audience today about how place-based is the step in achieving systemic change what would it be who would like to go first I think for us, the reason why we went place-based is because we wanted uh, a, a, a definitive parameter for measurement. One of the things that we've really been focused on is how do you talk about the impact that you're making and, and how do you measure it over time? And if you're committed for a generation, how do you know five years in that that generation is going to look different? 20 years from now or 25 years from now. And so one of the things that I would, would uh, leave as a parting thought is, you know, measuring social change is really difficult. Uh, it's definitely difficult for a board member who's sitting on a board to govern you and you're talking about a change that's not gonna happen for 25 years. Um, <laughs> and, and compensation and everything is based on that. But anyways, <laughs> I think what we've had to do is create um, tools that show what progress looks like and what are some of those leading indicators and how do you track that and build momentum over time and I just think you know as we think about this you know this is a, a uh, it's not an exact science, of right. course, uh, and I think that's a space where philanthropy can continue to partner, but when you're in a place, at least you have a, a defined parameter by which to measure and look at change. And So like in Detroit, for example, in 2018, Detroit was named by Brookings Institute as one of only 11 cities that made uh, advances in growth, prosperity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, you know, ways to measure and think about how are we making an impact and what's happening as change is happening in places. How do you define what success looks like? So Great. that's what we're working on. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Um, I, I, would, I would say the importance of place base for us uh, is also it's the best way to control both pace and narrative. Uh, and it really goes back to what Mayor Fine is talking about, uh, uh, about this idea of proximity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the way to make it personal with people. Mm -hmm. um, where, where you can, you know, I, I'm a big believer in this idea of, of, of every, everything that's happened has begun with a narrative change. Right? Narrative was always the leading indicator. Policy was always the lagging indicator. Every piece of good policy or bad policy that's ever been passed in this country mm -hmm. first started with a narrative change. Right? We were either told to be afraid of something and a policy was passed to protect us from it, or we were told to live up to our better angels and policy was passed to help us to honor that. Right? And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very data-driven person. Like, I really love data and I really love numbers uh, and analytics. Um, and so one of the reasons why I love Robinhood is because it's a very data-driven place. 
Um, but I remember uh, I was actually, uh, I wrote this, um, wrote this book called The Other West More, and I remember the first draft, I was talking with my editor, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do like a, the 10-step prescriptive guide for parents and mentors about how to help kids and so on and so forth. And he looked at me and he said, I'm gonna be honest with you, Wes, he said, that sounds really interesting. But the truth is, no one wants to read a parenting book by a 30-year-old with no children. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's actually the point. <laughs> and he said, make sure we understand the stories. Make sure we understand the story of these two kids. Mm. Yeah. Make sure we understand the journeys that they made, the decisions that they made, the decisions that were made for them. And people will get the point that you're trying to make without feeling like they're trying to be beaten over the head with something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like part of the power of place-based is people will feel the stories. They'll understand it at a very guttural level. They understand the streets you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They walk past the school that you're talking about. They see the kids' faces. And it helps to determine not just narrative, but it helps to determine pace. Thank you. Shirley. I, I actually think that the United States is on the, on, the, on the brink of really solving these issues. Because we've tried a lot of things. And we don't have to repeat them here. People know that. We talk, tried parts of it in silos. When we go to a place, we're actually bringing all of that together and we are really focusing on the partnerships, um, the partnerships between philanthropists, individual philanthropists, institutions, uh, community, um, and I mean, I'm not naming them all, in government. People say, well, why does government care? Well, government cares because it costs more money to serve an area with services that is not a healthy community. It just costs more money. Amen. Mm -hmm. And when it costs more money, it's hard to explain that to taxpayers. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. <laughs> so I, I, I really think that we're on, we're really on the edge, right on the cliff of saying that this is, and, and the data and the data that's out there tells us where. So I have a theory, so this is not um, I can't prove it to Wes yet. <laughs> but I have a theory that unless you can close the wealth and income gap in the South, you can't change it nationally. Oh, you don't, you don't have to prove it to me. I believe yeah, that. Right? Okay. Yeah, right? I believe that. So it's fine, and it's important for us to do it everywhere. Right. But if Kellogg is not in Mississippi, and someone else is not in Georgia, and somebody else is not in Alabama, and somebody else is not in Tennessee, and the Carolinas, et cetera, no time soon are we gonna see a major shift mm. in our poverty numbers. So I would just say to us that it's doable, but we have to have our eyes and ears wide open, and we have to be willing to face it where it exists, not just where we're comfortable to do the work. And I'm gonna go back to that as a closing, but I want Cindy, <laughs> I'm gonna resist. I want Cindy to share her thoughts. I guess just my thought is to celebrate all victories. You know, we all don't have to be taking on every major issue. What we did is we found um, a white space. We sort of went in, we had some assets, and we wanted to celebrate that victory that we had. And I have to tell you, it was a wonderful and easy ask. Our partners were actually like, oh, thank God, you know, you're not asking me to do a 10-year systems change. All you want is a game and our digital assets for a game to push out one message. So, you know, find, you know, there's different levels to get involved. There's entry points and exit points along the way. You know, our foundation likes to say the universe speaks. You just need to listen. You know, so, so tune into some of that and it could be a small opportunity to, boo, to do place-based in, or it could be some major long-term investment. So find what works for you. Thank you. And, and to, to, just, to just put a little bow on it, um, I just want to say when you hear all these pieces, when Shirley talks about we have to have this place-based in the neighborhoods, build the trust, be innovative, make mistakes. And as we get it right, we can adapt and we can evolve. 
until we finally get it right. And then what that allows is what Wes has done in New York, which is at, that, at the policy level in New York, things are changing. And then eventually, we're going to take these models and these successes and translate it into public policy change at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're going to be able to see the kind of change throughout the country that we're all aspiring to do. So all politics is local. It starts local. And that's where we get it right. We translate it, and we teach the rest of the country how to do it. So um, I've got the red sign up. So that means we're done. Thank you all. Thank this great panel. This has been wonderful.